school board candidates who will be running in the April 2nd uh, election for three seats on the St. Joseph School District Board. Uh, really quick, just a brief introduction to votestjoe.com. We are a faith-based, volunteer-run website that seeks to uh, inform voters of candidates' positions on certain issues, uh, as well as give information on upcoming local elections. Uh, you can always take a look at that at votestjoe.com. All of the candidates' uh, answers to the questions we ask will be posted on there by the end of our uh, session tonight. So if you have further uh, inspection you want to do on any of the candidates, the responses they gave will be uploaded onto that website. Uh, we have a, 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 lo a lot of candidates here tonight, so we're going to try to keep our evening to about 90 minutes. If you need to use the restroom during that time or you need to leave, just I would just ask that you do so um, respectfully of the people speaking and those around you. If you do have children here, I don't see any, but if you need to use, we do have two uh, nursing mother's rooms available. Uh, if you need to utilize those at any point in time, you can access those on the sides, uh, the side doors in the sanctuary. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to now invite up our candidates. Uh, why don't you give a welcome to all of our candidates this evening as they come up. Uh, this evening, I'm also going to ask that um, we refrain from any applause uh, until the end of the evening is over. Uh, and, and as well as this, we're here tonight to dialogue questions. It's not a debate. Uh, we ask that you don't have any interruptions to anyone who is speaking uh, this evening. And just we want to conduct ourselves with all honor and respect for uh, everyone at the table and everyone in the room. Um, and so we appreciate your cooperation with that. For each candidate, we will be asking a series of questions. You will each have approximately a minute to respond to that question and a closing time at the end for all of the, uh, for all of the things you might want to give to the audience regarding your candidacy. Uh, the first question we're going to start with, we'll start with Latonya Williams. And I want to start off on a positive note and ask all of you, what encourages you the most about the direction of the St. Joseph School District uh, as you currently see it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Latanya Williams, and I am the current president of the school board. And what gives me the most encouragement about the district is the progress. Um, it's been a lot of years. It was not any change at all in the school district, and now things are actually moving in happening and it's encouraging. I mean, our teachers now have a voice and they feel confident in being able to use it. And so if that's not encouraging, I really don't know what is. Thank you. Kenneth. Hi, good evening everyone. And uh, thank all the candidates for running. Uh, I think that's, in fact, the most encouraging thing we can all see here together right now. The amount of people running and the amount of people here at this gathering tonight. Keep up the good work and this is exactly what we need. We need more candidates running every time. We need more gatherings like this. So uh, that's the, mo that's the most you. obvious encouraging thing I can point out to all this uh, sitting right here. Thank you. Tammy? Good evening, my name is Tammy Pasley, and the most encouraging thing to me about the district as I sit here this evening is a staff that chooses to show up every day and educate our kids. And I feel like right now we have an administration that's probably the best that we've had in the 43 years that I've lived here in St. Joseph, and in the 34 years that I've worked in education, I can tell you from top to bottom, I feel like this is the best staff, the staff that best understands St. Joseph, the best, the staff that best understands what we deal with um, when it comes to educating our kids and the fact that they show up despite the many challenges that we have. So um, 
I'm very grateful and thankful for our staff. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Moore. And um, what echoes some of this, um, I'm going to try to squeeze in two things. I, I really am encouraged by the administration's relationship with the teachers um, and the administration's uh, commitment to be good leaders. And so I've seen a lot of that uh, just the past few months. Um, I think it's wonderful. And then the other thing I'd like to squeeze in is just some of the quality and talent of our students, right? So I was able to, to host a, a contest around... Uh, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and, and, and three teams from two different high schools presented ideas, problems in the community, and they presented solutions to kind of a professional, and, 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 they, and the winner was awarded $10,000 to implement their plan, and, 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 and the students, many of them never have done that before, just blew me away, and so very encouraging the talent we have in this district. I'm Jacob McMillan, and I want to thank you for being here tonight. I want to thank uh, Josh for having us and hosting events like this. And I think the most encouraging thing is our early learning centers that we're doing. Uh, we do have a reading proficiency problem here in St. Joe, and we've identified that if we can get kids reading by third grade, their success in testing and other educational endeavors goes up tremendously. So I think the early learning centers, uh, getting kids into preschools, getting them kindergarten ready has been a huge accomplishment for our district, and we need to continue to build upon that. Also, I think our English language learners, I am very proud of our city and our school district embracing the challenge of getting every child, whether they speak English as their primary language or not, getting every child educated. And it is, I'm a proud citizen to know that our school district is, in, is, is teaching and reaching out and building a relationship with every child despite language barriers. And I think you should be proud of that tonight. So we're focusing on getting kids reading by third grade. That is great. And we're overcoming language obstacles uh, of, of the children that are moving into our community. Thank you. This is going to be a tough pill to swallow. I'm not really encouraged by anything. I hate to say it, but I'm not. Our test scores are way down. They're bad. We're being, we may possibly get threatened by the state. Our facilities are falling apart, and we're trying to get a bond issue passed that a lot of people don't under, seem to understand. I, me personally, I'm in favor of it, but that's me personally. But when I see the, the encouragement I see is in the kids and in their faces. Uh, I've been a substitute, and one of the toughest classes I ever had to do was a group of second graders. And I had a, a student that was unruly. And the one and only time I ever had to call a resource officer was in that class. But I had a little girl sitting right in front of me. She was my encouragement because she sits there and she says, I hate this so much, but I want to be here. So that says a lot about our kids. Thank you. I think it's our academics committee. Ashley McGinnis leads it. You don't know the progress yet, but they took third grade. There's a pilot program. All these third graders went from 30% proficiency to 70% this year. So at the meeting Monday, they voted to expand this to all 13 schools. So if we can get all these third graders reading at 70% within a year, we save our accreditations and we don't lose them. So our academic committee led by Ashley McGinnis is my most hopeful for everything that's happening in, in the district. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rhonda Chesney. Um, I am a former educator in the St. Joe School District. I taught um, for 29 years in the school district, and currently I teach at Missouri Western education majors. So through my job at Missouri Western, I'm in a lot of classrooms in the St. Joe School District, and I think the most positive thing that I see through my job at Missouri Western is we have a lot of teachers who are teaching under contract while they're doing their student teaching, and the grade level partners that my students have have embraced them, have helped them to be successful uh, when they're just learning how to be a teacher and to keep them excited about the teaching profession because we want them to stay in teaching and we particularly want them to say, stay in the St. Joseph School District. So I am very happy to see uh, the collaboration and relationship building that teachers are doing for my students. And when this is happening, that in turn helps my students who are new to the teaching profession to be the best teachers they can be and support the children in our community. Thank you, thank you all. 
Uh, Kenneth, we'll start with you on this next question. Uh, in your opinion, what is the most pressing need within the education sector of our community that should be addressed by the school board and the school district in this current season? Excuse me. Uh, what the three goals have been this year, actually, uh, for the attendance, increased graduation rate, and um, also early childhood development expansion, which we've done. We still have a need for that, so that would be one of the things we could move towards correct uh, immediately. And we've really expanded that program by double in the last couple of years. And I say there's still a need out there. Everybody knows uh, that's one of the biggest bangs for our bucks. If we have those kids up to speed by third grade, we don't have to pull them through the system and they tend to become disruptive kids and things like that. Because I remember what it was like a long time ago to be fifth or sixth grader and you could add or you couldn't read and things like that. So if we don't have them up to speed by third grade, then it affects the rest of the people as well throughout their um, academic career, you know, K through 12. So th that continued expansion and then also we've almost have to do uh, something with the attendance. And I think we started well with the prosecutor recently helping us by actually putting it back to, on the parents. Thank you. Tammy? Okay, I think there are two needs that are almost interchangeable um, that can't really be separated, and that is behavior and academics. I think our district really has to get serious about behavior. Um, when behavior in the classroom is out of control and teachers aren't able to teach, academics aren't going to be, be able to be met. And so I think coming on to the board, uh, we need to take a very serious uh, look at academics and that needs to be a priority. And I know that our superintendent, Dr. Edgar, has already mentioned that as a high priority for next year, to be able to rid our classrooms of those challenging behaviors so that our other students can uh, can be taught and our teachers can teach. And then academics, being a, a career educator, that's high on my priority list. Um, you know, uh, it's not rocket science <laughs> to be able to raise test scores. I hate that uh, we have to be tied to a state test, but we are uh, in order to meet um, compliance to be able to get our state funding. And so we just have to be rigorous in making sure that the standards, the Missouri Show Me standards are being taught in our classrooms every day, reviewed in our classrooms every day, um, embedded in our curriculum, and uh, that our kids are being successful in achieving those standards, and it can be done. I've taught my career in the Savannah School District. We have always been met those standards high and above the state, sta or the state average, and it can be done here in St. Joseph also. We're doing a great job implementing that in our um, young children, and we need to make sure we're doing that at every level, and I know how to get that done. I've taught teachers how to do that. Thank you. Mike? I think a month or so ago, my answer would have been, uh, you know, behavioral issues and attendance, and, and I've recently expanded that to talk about really teacher support as a whole, and so, you know, the February board meeting was so interesting. The topic was the four-day school week, but the clear takeaway with that meeting was our teachers are in trouble. Um, they, they need support. Do they, do they deserve more pay and need more pay? Absolutely, but there's a reason behind it other than they deserve it, and that is that the, we can't attract enough teachers and staff to fill all the jobs. There are dozens of jobs open in the district, and the result of that are overloaded teachers and overloaded staff. And so we need to do whatever it takes to become attractive enough as a district to fill those jobs and show those teachers that they're supported. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, the biggest need that we need to draw attention to is accreditation. Uh, we have a three-year cycle in the state of Missouri, and you have to be above a 70. And two years ago, we were a 69 or a 67. Last year, we were a 62. We have not met uh, accreditation standard. And if we don't make it this year, uh, we are going to be at the mercy of the state on what they want to do. And if you lose accreditation so you don't know, uh, that means our district would have to pay the tuition for our kids to go to different districts. So that's our tax money sending our kids to other districts, which would be detrimental for our community. So I think accreditation is our big goal. We gotta get above the state minimum of 70. 
And to do that, we need great staff. But teachers can be compensated, but they also, they want conduct cleaned up. We can't have kids hitting, spitting, and yelling at teachers and being in the classroom all day and the next day and the next day. We have to get back to suspending kids that are disrupting classrooms so that the other kids can learn and can advance. And so I think good teachers and support them on conduct, watch our classroom sizes, but there's only one marker for next year that the board needs to make sure, and that's getting us above 70 of accreditation. Um, I would have to say, it, like everybody else pretty much said here, it's a, it's a discipline issue. We need to get the uh, discipline in the, in the classrooms under control. And when the, with that, we need to, to uh, support the teachers and back the teachers. You know, they get stuck in the corner themselves, and if they need help, then we need to be, need to be there to help them. You know, a lot of us in this room were in those classes back in the day where if we did something wrong in school, boy, we got it at home, didn't we? But not anymore. It's the teacher's fault now. And it can't be that way. So once again, I say we need to worry about take care of the discipline and get to the teachers and give them the protection they need. And is like in the military, we say, we got your six. We got your back. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly? I think it's policy. We pick you can just use the mic. Thank okay. you. I think it's policy. We pick and choose what policy we follow and what we don't. I can name several. Cell phones is an example. Teachers use them. Students using them. There's policy on this. There's policy when you. There's policy on everything. I leave a school board meeting. I invested in this book. It cost me over a hundred dollars just because. You find a policy in something, but there's ten other places you have to go. You see how big this is. I promise I will study and follow everything. If our district followed their own policy, you wouldn't see things happening like this. The discipline. There's policy for that. We don't follow it. Assault is assault. I don't care how old you are. If you hit a teacher, the police should immediately be called. I, that's assault. We can't let things like that go. That's our problem. It's all right here. Everything you need is right here. When we follow it, we change the district. I promise I will on everything. Thank you. I think one of the things I know that lots of people have already said this, but is to think about children's behaviors. Um, as a former educator, I taught my entire career in title buildings where I did have children with very strong behaviors. And one of the advantages I had was our school chose to use our money to educate all of the teachers as well as the secretary and the custodian and everyone in our building about how to help children when they have those strong behaviors. I feel like our district has um, enacted an alternative school so that the children do have another place to go. And I think one of the things that we have to think about even as a community is how can we wrap around these children who are coming to school with behaviors that are very inappropriate for their age level and what are we going to do to support families families and um, encourage them to come into the schools to get to know them. But I think we really need to look at the whys of the why the children are acting the way they're acting so we can understand how to, pre how to uh, address those behavior needs in a preferable way. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhonda, we're going to start with you on this next question. Okay. We Excuse had a... me. It's my turn. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that became the end for me, so I apologize. I know it's confusing. Yes, please. A pressing need is our teachers. As Mike Moore mentioned about a month ago, our teachers came to the school board screaming, crying, and begging. Our educators are on fire, and our school board ignored them. A pressing need is to listen to the educators. Kids are not able to learn at all unless our educators are taken care of. Um, test scores cannot improve unless our educators are taken care of. Attendance cannot improve. Accreditation cannot be achieved unless our educators are adequately taken care of, and that is not currently happening in our district. And so a big pressing dire need is we have to not only listen, but take care of our educators. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rhonda, uh, we had a community member 
email in about early childhood programs. What is your perspective on the early childhood education uh, programs, and do you have any vision for how they can be best utilized within the school district? Okay. My entire teaching career was in early childhood, so I have a lot of knowledge and schema for that. And I think um, when our community backs an early childhood program, we're backing children when their brain development is making permanent connections for the rest of our life. Um, so I believe that investing our money in early childhood is one of the best places to put it for uh, not only are, are their brains making permanent connections, but this is where we can start that family engagement piece where families can get used to what school looks like, where they can understand what school looks like, where where we can support them uh, through struggles they may have through parenting. I did home visits uh, when I was an early childhood teacher in the district, and I know right now we offer lots of opportunities for families through our Parents as Teachers program, and I really think when the district is looking at where the most bang for their buck and the long-term bang for their buck would be through early childhood. Thank you. LaTanya? As everyone knows, I spend every day, all day, with early childhood education. Um, you cannot expect a child to just appear at a school in kindergarten and they know how to act in school. Kids need proper training as early as you're able to give them. A lot of early childhood education centers, child care centers, curriculum is available for babies, even at a year old, just like at my agency. Um, kids need the opportunity to learn as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you. It's you, Kenneth. Uh, yes, thanks. I kind of feel like I've drunk, jumped ahead on this comment, though. So it's always been um, times I've been involved and in, uh, stepped up to run. Uh, it's always been uh, taxpayers first about everything. You guys are paying the bills. So it's always taxpayers first, and then we'll get everything else we need and want. After that, it's been always my childhood development because the more we expand that, we still need have a need for 300 kids in that program, it's always the biggest bang for our buck, as I've already said. Then finally, it's always been, my three, teacher compensation. We're always ranked nationally already, uh, 48 out of 50. Uh, so the um, thing about early childhood, it's not a quick reward. We have to stick with it for five to seven years. That third grader has to become a freshman and never let happen what before in our district two years ago when we had 300 freshmen out of our 750 class that got zero credits for the entire year. You know what we call them in the St. Angel School District? Sophomores. We should all be arrested for allowing that to happen. And that was a policy that got changed because there was a no-fail policy put in place by our last superintendent. Thank you. Tammy? Early childhood um, education is a vital part of education and it's especially vital when we are in a community where we have 73% free and reduced lunch where we have a very high poverty level and so I'm extremely proud of the district for opening our early learning center in the south end and then this past year opening our early learning center in the middle of town at Mark Twain and I hope that we grow that program to open an early learning center in the north end so that we are reaching as many children as possible um, to be able to, to uh, start them in their education process long before they do hit the kindergarten uh, level. And uh, when we do that, we'll see a, a tremendous change in kids being successful in reading on grade level at the third grade level. Yeah, my perspective on early childhood really comes from, from teachers and the community who uh, repeatedly uh, tell us it's a priority and it's a very important to a child's education. So I believe that. And, you know, to me, to continue to support those, those programs that Tammy mentioned, expansion of those early childhood programs within the district, 
and then other agencies around town, you know, people like uh, parents as teachers who get in and help families and get kids ready to go to school. Uh, to support that would be my vision. Thank you. I wish I could yield my time to my wife. Uh, she teaches first grade at Pickett. She's at parent conferences and I, but she is uh, early childhood certified. And she reminds me every day of the importance of those early years of education and getting kids going. You know, if kids can go into kindergarten knowing their letters and numbers, then we can work on phonics, then we can work on sentence structure. But when kids go into kindergarten and they don't know their letters and numbers, then we're already behind. And so our early childhood centers really do a good job of getting kids ready for kindergarten. I just would like to see us uh, increase the awareness and availability, keep doing parents as teachers. It's one of the greatest presentations we've had at Academics Committee about three months ago. We got to hear from our parents as teachers and the great work they do. Uh, but ultimately, these early ages are very important because they lay a foundation that older grades cannot go back and lay. Your fifth and sixth grade teachers are not trained and do not have the time to go back and lay early childhood foundations. So we got to get it right from the very beginning. I think that, uh, like a lot of things that have been said already, the early childhood development is a very crucial thing. Even if it starts in the home, you know, just talking to your kids, letting them watch Sesame Street, you'd be amazed how much they learn just watching Sesame Street. But still, uh, kids are they're sponges. They want to learn. They really do. Someone may say, well, I don't want to learn, you know, history, but, you know, I want to learn what SpongeBob's saying. Well, you know what? Maybe SpongeBob's got something smart to say for a chance. But anyway, it, it's... Um, I'm trying to read the question at the same time, sorry. Um, I think, yeah, like I said, early, early childhood is, is, is a good thing to have. It is, the education there at that level is something that is needed very badly. Uh, I understand that the school district is looking at adding a third school for early childhood development. I think that's a very good thing in the right direction and get them, and let's get them in school early. Thanks. Thank you. I think we're headed in the right direction with early childhood. It's the smartest thing we've done since I've, I've only been following school district for five years. I don't know all the past of everything, but I think it'll make a major difference. I think the pilot program with the third graders within a year already showed major difference. I think we should be dumping more money into the education, not shiny new buildings, not all the vacations and, and things that I just see that DoorDash, we should never spend money on flivorous whatever. Everything should go to education. That, that We are here for students. We are here to get every child educated and get them through school. Our graduation work, we got to figure out what's going on and, and help these kids in any way possible. I don't care how much money we spend. I want it all to go direct to get our kids through school. Thank you. Jacob, we're gonna start with you on this next question. The Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education reports that St. Joseph students are significantly underperforming in math and language arts. Our graduate diploma level is nearly 14% under the state level. A student attendance is also well below the state average. How do you see the school board's role in helping address uh, improving academics? Yeah, I think we've talked about it a lot tonight, but it starts with classroom behavior. It's hard to learn when you're uh, being, dis being disturbed or being distracted by students in your classroom. It's hard to teach when you have kids that are pulling on you and yelling and running around and running through the halls. So I think classroom conduct is one. I also think teacher recruitment and retainment is another one. And I think we need to have a, a multi-prong approach to that. It doesn't just have to be a four-day. If our test goes are, are low, I think we need our kids in the class as much as we can get them. And so I think we need to stay with five days, but I think we need to look at compensation and classroom conduct and classroom size. And I think that's gonna help our improvement. It's the best teachers you have, because the greatest asset this district has is our teachers. That relationship in the classroom is the most essential thing. So we need to improve that, and we need to protect it from being taken away. Because one less day with our teachers is not going to raise test scores. Losing a, 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 a reading lesson on a Friday cannot be made up in four minutes scattered Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you want your test scores to come up. You keep the kids in the classrooms. You recruit and retain the greatest teachers using compensation, conduct improvement, and classroom size. And then we'll see improvement. Thank you. Warren? Well, once again, it, it's like the, there's a, it's been said is that uh, we got to deal with the discipline problem of, of the 
getting the kids in school to begin with. Uh, attendance has been a very big issue with the school district here lately, but we gotta really address how we can uh, take care of that problem uh, because some of the kids don't show up just because mom needs them to babysit their younger sibling that day. So I think that's one of the big things that needs to be addressed, like I said, is attendance. Um, we need to keep them in the, in the classroom. And a lot of people are not gonna probably like this, but uh, we gotta stay with the five day a week for now. Uh, I think we've blamed a lot on COVID. I think COVID had a lot to do with it. Uh, but once again, I think we need to get caught up. And if that means be five days a week, five days a week. If that means we're going into the summer, we're going into the summer. We're getting summer school. We're getting these kids' grades back up. We're getting their GPAs up to a sustainable level. So, thank you. Thanks. Kim? I think we got to figure out why these kids aren't graduating. Well, what's the core reason? What is happening? I think we got... A, a lot of great people, staff, but they're all have doctorate degrees. I, I don't see how someone with a doctorate degree could ever understand a child that has not finished school. The, the mindsets are totally different. I, I think we need a different kind of people, uh, more like me. I have no degrees, no, but we got to reach them in a way that we can understand them and I don't I think someone with a doctorate degree doesn't understand what's happening and that's part of our problem I think we need to go back to basics and just figure out what is happening why are they not graduating there, there's reasons we can figure this all out but it's going to take other people that have lived this to help give information on why is this not happening I think on that too thank you just from my experience of being in the classroom, um, I've experienced the challenges uh, connected with trying to raise academic achievement. Um, I agree with what's been said that we need to look at the behavioral needs of our children and meet those needs. I wanna also add, I think, another perspective on it is how are we working really hard to build relationships with families so they want to send their children to school. Also, I think another piece of that is building relationships with the children that we have in the classroom. I didn't know that was a key factor when I first started teaching, uh, that how important relationship building was. But once I figured that out, because I had a wonderful principal who helped me figure that out, I realized that when I started building relationships with the children in my classroom, they were willing to do pretty much anything for me. And I could see when they went to the next grade level and that teacher didn't have that same perspective on things, how she some of those those children really struggled being in the room, but I, I firmly believe that building relationships with children is important. Therefore, as a board, we also have to have good relationships with each other. So we are modeling what that looks like from the top down of our school district. Thank you. As I look at the question, I'm looking at a lot of different issues, a lot of different problems and every problem could have eight to 10 answers and such. And then I look at the end of the question and it lists the school board's role. Our role um, directly involves creation and the implementation of the policies to address those issues. It is not to actively correct those issues on our own, but that's, it will be getting too much into the weeds and the jobs of the admin and the teachers and such. And so the school board members role would be the creation and the implementation of the policies in order to address all those issues individually. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we may have touched on this already, but, um, you know, why our need is so great, and we cannot be compared with almost any other district in the state, is because of our high poverty rate. This exacerbates everything from discipline to attendance. Um, so we have to be aware of that. I'll go back and then again thank the current prosecutor's office for that has had a ripple. I've heard it out in the community 
about when there's seven or eight people had their name on the front page about not getting their kids to school, hey, that catches on real quick. And you know, up until 16, actually, the parent is responsible legally. So there's no excuse. We cannot blame it on the kid, the student at all, up until, I would say, at least freshman year. It's the parent problem up until their freshman year why they're not coming to school. And if we need to list more people every day on websites about the people who aren't getting their kids there. Now, luckily, the, thank you very much. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm running for the board is my concern over the academic status of our district. And Mrs. Williams, Ms. Williams is so correct in saying that as a board member, my role will be to support the Academic Services Committee, making sure there's policy there and making sure they have what they need to help our teachers be successful so that our students will be successful. But I was very fortunate as a classroom teacher for many years to work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in curriculum and assessment. And so if I have a specialty at all, it is in curriculum and, and assessment. And I have held workshops and had, held professional development teaching teachers how to bring up their test scores with their students. And so I think I bring that skill set to the board and offer that to our academic services to be just another uh, source of, of ideas and thinking outside the box on how we can do that. Um, as Mr. McMillan mentioned, uh, we do not want to lose our accreditation. It may seem as easy as farming our kids out to other districts. That's not going to happen. Other districts are full. What's going to happen is the state is going to come in and take over our district. And that is something that we do not want to happen. That would be the worst thing ever. I served on a committee and I went to St. Louis to a district that was taken over and I was part of that team that went in and evaluated that district and it was horrid. It is something that we can't even begin to think about happening to our, or to our town, to our staff and to our kids in St. Joe. So you're right, we do have to raise the score and I'm willing to get down in the trenches with our teachers and our staff and find the way to raise our test scores and that is a skill set that I will bring to the board. As far as the board's role in supporting academic improvement, you know, uh, three things come to mind. The first one I mentioned, which is just do everything we can to make the district a great place to work to attract and retain the best teachers we absolutely can. Um, the second thing I would mention, especially for older students, I think there's great opportunity to tie their education to career development, right? So when, it, when, a, when a child, when a student has their eye, especially a high school has their eye on graduating and earning a living, I think we can jump in and take advantage of that by tying what they're working on to a possible future job. And, you know, guys, the business community is hurting for workforce. And so businesses, the state, uh, right now, they are absolutely um, um, allies in supporting that kind of thinking. And then the last thing I would mention is really uh, one of the board's roles, I think, is to model the behaviors we expect in the classroom and from our students. And so, you know, just be great citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. The next question, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an involved question, but we'll start with Tammy this time. According to the American Library Association, uh, 2023 saw a 65% increase in parents challenging sexually explicit books dealing with topics of gender identity and LGBTQ issues found in school libraries across the nation. This has brought up concerns about parental rights and consent regarding to what their children have access to without their knowledge or permission. So the question, does the school board have a role to play in ensuring that parents are aware of what's in their school libraries, as well as ensuring that books of a sexual nature are not introduced into the system? Okay, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think the board's role in that is to make sure that parents have access and to knowing what is available in our school libraries. And I'm sorry that I missed the last academic uh, committee meeting where our librarians spoke and, and 
and laid out how that is available to our, to our parents here in the St. Joseph School District. But just based on my knowledge as a teacher for 34 years, I will tell you that I think that it's important that every school district or every school in our school district would have available on their website a least list of books that are available in the school. And then um, <clears throat> parents can, I'm, I'm, and I'm saying this kind of loosely, so those of you that were at that meeting, I know Jacob was, uh, can tell me uh, if this is true or not, but I think that those books, you as a parent can request those books to be tagged and they can be tagged and you will know that. That's more than I thought was available. Um, but then I believe from that point on, it is the parent's responsibility to be paying attention to what's, a, what's coming into your home. And if that is not something that you want in your home, then that is your responsibility. Because we have lots of different students, you know, in public education, we serve all the children, even the least of them. And um, I feel like there comes a point when it's the parent's responsibility to making sure they know what is being brought into their home and what their children are reading. So um, that's where I stand. But the board should definitely make available to parents what is in school libraries. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I see the board's role in this as really tertiary, right? First, first line of defense is, is the parent and the student, the parent and the child. And so, you know, parents' responsibility to make it very clear uh, what's acceptable and what's not uh, for their student. You know, secondly, I think it goes to the parents and the librarian, right? So these librarians are well-trained professionals, and they are open to listening to parents to say, hey, there's stuff that I don't want my child uh, to check out and be exposed to, and librarians will facilitate that. And so then thirdly, you get to the board, which to me is we just got to make sure for those instances where uh, a book is considered for removal, for example, that, that there is a very formal approved, board approved process by which that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you have not watched the academics meeting, I would encourage you to go watch it. Uh, you go to the Board of Education, you gotta enter their portal, you then you gotta click meetings, then you gotta scroll down to academics, and you can click and get the agenda. And then also on the Board of Education, you can watch their YouTube channel. But what the concern I brought to our, our district uh, last month was that parents deserve to be notified of the books their children are checking out. Right now, the system is that as a parent, I would call and say, I do not want my children to check out XYZ. And then when that book is scanned, the warning is not about the book. The warning is about what the parents have requested. So the librarian is still on the hook to know every book in the library and to know whether that book contains that stuff. And that's too much to put on our librarians. They have 27 kids to check out. So if we adopt a system like the public library has, which is called a receipt notification system, every time your child checks a book out, you'll get an email, which makes you the parent and not the librarian. And also I'll say this, there is no room for graphic sex in our libraries. And those books need to be evaluated by this board and those books need to be removed. That's not a worldview issue, that's a graphic sex issue. It's okay to have books of every worldview, but the parents need to be notified. If I'm a Muslim family and my kid is reading a Christian book, they deserve to be notified. If I'm a Christian family and my kid's reading a, a book of a different worldview, I, I deserve to be notified. It's not about one worldview over another. It's about letting parents be parents and making sure they're involved in the education of their children. Thank you. I, I do think that the school has a responsibility letting them know what, the, uh, uh, what their kids are checking in and out. Um, and, what, and the parent does have every right in the world to know what's going through the, the libraries and all their schools. You know, I don't see any reason why you can't walk in and, or find out uh, what's in there. And, and, but also you gotta watch that tight line you, you walk about what books, you know, you consider one way or the other. Um, as far as instilling the books that, of uh, that nature, they're not introduced in the system, that's, I think mean, we can do everything that we can, you know, as parents, but you know, the kids are gonna find out eventually. And I'm not saying they need to find out through the library, but once again, um, you know, what is a, is a biology book considered a book of a sexual nature? That's the, that's the tight line I'm talking about, about, is that slippery slope right there. But I, also, I agree with what you said about, you know, if there's a, a book that uh, your parent, the parents should know what their kids are checking out. Thank you. Thank you. First, I'm going to say we do not co-parent with the government, okay? And I'm not putting it all on parents. This is our community. 
These are our kids. Whether they're our kids or not, we got to protect them. Not just the parents. Like you said, we got 70% free and reduced lunch. These might not be the kind of parents that are watching everything. Our crime rate is high. No, as a society, as a community, we watch all the kids, not just ours. As of now, the librarians, they get to choose. Each librarian in each school gets to choose what comes in, and the principal approves it. That is our system right now. I do not agree with it. I do think the board should have a list of those. Whoever's on the board, whether they decide to check or not, I guarantee I will. And I'm not going to say ban books, but age appropriate. Our grade schools cannot have sexual books in them. And some of the explicit books, McMillan, he did an awesome job. If you guys missed that, I'll give him all the credit in the world. Some of this I did not know the books we have here, but right now we have <laughs> some extremely bad. I didn't think we did. I didn't think it was here at our community, but it is, and we have them now in every school. I do encourage you to watch that meeting because he knows a lot about some of these books. Thank you. I think one of the things um, that we need to keep in mind that a vast majority of the children in our schools age-wise are still minors, and um, I think we need to keep that in mind. I also think that we do want to encourage parents to be involved not only in what books they're reading, but in all of the education. And if we can build that relationship with families, get them into the schools, then they are going to want to be involved and want to more look at what the library books are that their children are bringing home. But at the end of the day, um, I would like to see families want to be more involved and therefore make some decisions uh, for their children. Also, if a family would have a concern about a book and they would bring it to to the school board I am more than willing to read that book and have the conversations with the families have conversations with other board members uh, so that some things can be looked at as a group thank you mm -hmm. of course as a parent I believe in parental choice I also believe that as a parent I already have that choice I'm the mom, I'm the mom of three daughters. Everyone's a reader. And I always make sure that I, I know they're librarians. I know what my daughters are reading. I'm responsible on the information that my daughters are able to check out. I'm not responsible on the information that your daughters are able to check out. I also trust our librarians. If I'm not able to trust the judgment of the librarians, then why are they even, are they even in the building? Don't get me wrong, I am against insects, rape, graphic, pornography, but I also love the Bible and all of that's in there too. So. I think that we all need to use our own judgment on our own kids and not for everybody else's. Thank you. Thank you. We have computers. There should be a complete listing of every book in every library, and it should be available to everyone. There should also be available a, a no checkout list so that the parent can review the list that's are, that are in that library, each library, and then if there's a li they want to have their, that they should be able to do it. That's why we have computers, it can be done. And I think when the board would be involved is that, yeah, if there's a final, I think we should definitely be involved in the final say, especially if something gets flagged where something it becomes controversial in some shape or form, uh, then should we do that? should have access to review that as well. And then um, basically let the parent be the parent. Thank you all. Uh, we're going to start with Mike on this next question. According to a 2022 survey done by City Journal, of randomized set of 1,800 recent high school graduates across the nation, 
62% of the students reported being taught in a class that America is a systemically racist country. 69% reported being taught white people have white privilege. And 67% report being taught that America is built on stolen land. All of these assertions are sourced in what we would know as critical race theory, which is based on a highly biased and controversial ideology. As a school board member, do you support or stand against these ideas being introduced through curriculums or teachers in our school district? Yeah, you know, uh, listen, I, I, support the, I support us teaching history, and I guess when I think about it, it's the history that, you know, I learned when I was, was younger, right, so everybody's in a different time. Um, I, I, I would say this to you. Um, I went to a grade school that uh, probably seven years before I attended was completely segregated. And um, as I grew up, um, I just thought they were, everybody was the same. We were friends, we were classmates, we did everything together. Um, it became clear to me as I got older that not everybody felt like that. And, and so um, to the extent we can teach not in a divisive way, right? So I'm not talking about we need to feel bad about where we've been, but we need to understand where we've been. And, and you know, by that, learn how to really treat each other like human beings. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Martin Luther King lost his life uh, with the mission of saying that one day we would not judge people by the color of their skin, but the character of their heart. I don't think it's ever appropriate to tell a kid or adult that they are disadvantaged or that they don't have as good of opportunity because of the color of their skin. It's also not wise to pit races against each other. We've overcome that in our country, and there's no reason to go back to it. Critical race theory wants us to teach children that the color of their skin is either advantageous or it's oppressive. Folks, that, that's, not, that's not correct. Everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone uh, has the same capabilities, no matter the color of their skin, in this school district to succeed, and we must protect that. And so critical race theory would not be uh, an ideology that I would support in this district based on the accomplishments of the civil rights movement of this country. Thank you. Um, I'm not, I think critical race theory is, is like you said, is a very divisive uh, issue that was brought up a few years ago. And when the, when the term systemically racist came about, I had to look up the word systemically and what it meant. And what it meant was is that everything and everybody is a racist. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Absolutely the furthest thing. Because they, they were pushing that issue on the police departments at the time. So they were basically saying that every cop in the world is a racist. No. It's like saying everybody up here is a racist. We're not. Not a single person up here is a racist. I'd like to think they're not. But, you know, I agree with 100% what he says, you know, that we are who we are. We've got to go forward. But we also have to realize where we did come from, the mistakes we did make. We should learn from those. Unfortunately, I didn't learn about the massacre of Tulsa until just recently. I mean, I never heard of that about in high school. But in retrospect, also, my son, who's now 38 years old, was never taught about the Cold War. But that wasn't nothing to do about racism. But like I said, we, we have to learn the good with the bad and go forward and quit going backwards. Thank you. 100% against critical race theory. Basically, that's teaching you to be racist. White privilege, I mean, you're teaching to be racist. I am absolutely against it. The woke ideology in the United States has caused us just to go straight downhill. Like, we can do better than that. This, we're not racist anymore. That whatever happened back then was before our time. We never, none of us experienced anything like that. We shouldn't be held accountable or made to feel guilty or like it has anything to do with us. That's not society today. We don't see that. So, yeah, let's not bring it in because it's not there unless you make it. I think one of the beauties of teaching small children is that they don't see what we as adults sometimes see. And so I really wish that as adults we could see our world from a children, from a small child's point of view, 
who just wants to come to school and love being at school and love learning, and I think that's important. I think we have to be really careful uh, that we are getting so far away that we're boxing all people into boxes and that we need to look at what we all do well and really look at people's hearts. I agree with Jacob that uh, we are made in God's image and we have to keep that in mind and work towards uh, working together as a society instead of trying to figure out who we're out to get on any given day. So um, I, that's what I wish we could do is just see our world from a small child's point of view. Thank you. As I look at the question, I have a lot I could say, but I only have a minute. And so I'm going to keep this brief. Critical race theory um, is a theory that I never came across until I was in a doctoral program, and it is not designed at all for elementary schools, middle schools, or high schools, or public schools, period. Um, and to answer the question, even though I do not agree with the definition of it as it's listed, I would not be agreeable to putting critical race theory in our schools. Thank you. Um, our country's made mistakes. Our society makes mistakes. And we, fortunately, in our country, have learned from them. So, I don't think that, that our schools are the place to continue to remind us of these mistakes. I think we just need to keep it simple. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, and then the individual, by the time they're out of high school, should be able to make their own decision about these different theories. Reading, writing, and arithmetic solves our problems. Okay, I do not feel there is any place in K-12 education for the teaching of critical race theory. It's been taught since the 1960s at the college level. I feel it is very appropriate at that level because by then students have the maturity level and the higher thinking skills to be able to have a discussion, but definitely not K-12 education. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start, uh, actually Warren, I'm going to start with you on this question. <laughs> uh, Warren, we, we do live in a very politically polarized age. How will you seek to bring unity and dignity to the school board with various voices and differing opinions in one group? Well, there was a survey that was put out to all of us, and well, I think the very last question out was that do you identify as a Republican, a Democrat, other? I marked other put Kansas City Chiefs fan. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and some people think, oh, you're just being a smart aleck. No, I'm very serious. I mean, I have voted for both sides of the ticket through my entire life. I vote for what's the good of the country. I vote for what's the good of the school district. And that's why I'm up here. You know, they often ask the question also, why did you want to do this? Because I want to do what I can as a blue collar individual my entire life with a two years of college under my belt, if I'm lucky, uh, and bring everything to say, hey, we gotta talk, we have to get through all this, we can't do blue, red, we have to go down the middle, think red, white, and blue, and get these issues taken care of. And if it's academics, attendance, discipline, anything like that, but still, like I said, we gotta get together and work on it as one. I say we follow policy. Everything's in here. If we are following policy, we're not going with our own opinions. We're following the guidelines that were put out and set out to follow. We don't follow policy. I'm going to tell you right now. I look it up all the time. We pick and choose what we want to follow. When we follow this, 
we shouldn't have any argument about anything. The policy is policy, and if we were following it, there shouldn't be a problem. I think there are two things that we can do, and one is to be a listener and to genuinely listen to what the other person has to say in a respectful manner. Uh, the second thing is we ultimately have to keep in mind our job on the school board is children. Uh, because without children, there is no school district. And so I think we need to work really hard to work together and to always keep in mind our job is to do what is best for the children in our community. Uh, because we do all have a responsibility uh, with the kids in our community to wrap around them. And so I think uh, the, the eyes that go on our school district really do go to the school board. It's what's recorded, it's what's out there for anybody in the whole entire world to see. And so I think we need to listen to each other, collaborate and work together so that we are a team doing what's best for children. School boards are nonpartisan. It's a reason it was made like that. Our kids are nonpartisan. It doesn't matter um, about a political party in a classroom or on a school board. Um, our school board is extremely diverse. It's a representation of our community. Um, and with um, Diversity comes with a lot of different views and opinions, a lot of differences. If everyone could just put the kids above everything else, above your egos, above your differences, above your anger, above your churches, above your friends, I think that everything could be so much better. And that's easier said than done a majority of times. Only as, as long as everyone continues to try and remember, kids are, what's the, kids are most important. I think it can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you. It is true that our board is the most diverse school board in history. It's also the youngest school board in history. The school district of St. Joseph has been around about 160 years. So, um, kind of on this subject, hey, welcome to my world. Um, I say the way to do it is keep showing up. Keep fighting for the right people. I agree there could be quite a little bit more decorum that was bestowed upon our organization at this point. But um, this is the debate stage, debate stage for a reason. And um, our diversity and our difference in opinions are reflected uh, for all of you to see. So I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep working for the taxpayer early childhood development and the teacher's compensation. Okay, I skipped that question on the questionnaire because the school board is set up to be nonpartisan. And as long as I am a part of the school system, I hope that we can keep that a nonpartisan um, entity. But I will tell you that I ran first for the school board in 2016 and then was overwhelmingly reelected in 2019. And the reason I decided to come back in this election is because of one reason specifically, and that is to bring order and decorum to the school board. Um, it's desperately needed, and um, I think that's something I can bring. I have a vast amount of experience in education. I have six years of experience as a school board member, 92 hours of school board training, and surely within all of that experience, uh, I can uh, be able to work with the board and help us to be a team that supports education because I'm passionate about kids, I'm passionate about public education, it has been my life's work and it is serious. 
and public education is hard and we need a board that is focused to do the best for our kids and so order and decorum is important. Yeah, um, so unity and dignity. I guess the first thing I would say is just do my very best to treat others like I want to be treated, right? And um, at a bigger level with teamwork, uh, there's, a, there's an author named Lencioni who wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Picture, if you will, a pyramid. At the top of this pyramid are results, the results we all want to get. At the bottom, the foundation of this pyramid is trust. And so Lencioni explains that, that, that without this trust, you'll never be successful. And, and the kind of trust he's talking about is the kind of trust that can lead to the next level in the pyramid, which is healthy conflict, right? So we're never going to all agree. There's no perfect person, process, or place. But if we can get to a point where we respect each other, treat each other good enough to have those discussions, move to that point where we can have that healthy conflict, we can deliver great results. Since I went last on the last question, I would like to circle back around to critical race theory. For those who say it's not in our curriculum, it is in our libraries. All Boys Aren't Blue, the first six chapters of that book is critical race theory where every white teacher this author had lied to him and told him the wrong history. So it is present in St. Joseph, Missouri. And dealing with this question, I think we can debate all day long. I think we can be diverse all day long. I think we can disagree all day long. That doesn't mean you have to degrade the person that you're talking to. That doesn't mean that you can threaten them and intimidate them if they disagree with you. I think we need more professionalism and respect on our board. I think we need to stop interrupting people. We need to set meeting expectations. We need to stay on topic. and We need to make sure it's not. And my promise to this community is every night I go home to my wife and children, I will never act in any way to bring shame upon them. They mean the world to me. And so the way we behave in public, they share my last name. And so I will behave and conduct myself in every meeting to where when I go home at night, I'm proud of what I, how I acted. Thank you. We hold our, just hold our applause. Thank you. Uh, Ken, we're going to start with you on this one. Across the nation, we have seen school boards play a significant role in dealing with policies, dealing with human sexuality, gender identity. Uh, would you support policies allowing students to use restrooms or locker rooms or participate in sports based on their preferred gender rather than their natural born gender? I did, but we can. Uh, um, well, I, I got to ask, answer that question the last time I was here in front of your organization. And the way I feel about that is the way you was born is the way you was born. My answer to that is no. I deal with this right now um, as I teach after retirement in a high school setting. And we have students that choose to um, choose to be identified as a gender besides the gender that they were um, born into, and there are um, things set up for them to be able to use the restroom and use locker rooms in that, and they work perfectly fine, and it doesn't make our other students uncomfortable, and so the school districts already have things in place, and everybody's happy, and the kids are fine, and we're taking good care of them, but um, I, as long as it is, it is their preferred, I say no. Um, I feel like we need to consider all of our students. Yeah, I, you know, I prefer that uh we use the restrooms and, and we play on the sports teams um, per the gender that we were born with. Um, I will say this, you know, I, I tend not to think about getting too wound up about the restroom part of it as far as new construction, right? There's a great example of, of addressing this situation in the new Kansas City airport, right? So, so we've got We've got wall-to-wall -wall doors and, wall, and, and, and total privacy. There are separate private changing rooms. And so, you know, I, I go in there and I wash my hands next to a, a, a lady and, and that, that all works fine, right? So, um, but 
Yeah, to answer your first part of your question, yeah, I prefer it when we play on the sports teams and we use the restrooms that we're born with. Thank you. Yeah, when it comes to bathrooms and locker rooms, biological sex determines which facility a student uses. Um, I, I understand Mike's uh, approval of the Kansas City Airport, but that structure would be very difficult in a school setting because teachers need to see what stalls are being used and who's in those stalls. And so uh, I think we just need to build facilities based on the biological sex that they were born with. But I also think in a crowd like tonight, it's a good reminder that the greatest thing we can do in our school district is recruit every family of every lifestyle. So while bathrooms and sports teams may be restricted to biological sex, we need to respect every family and every worldview in our community. Because the more kids we get into our district, the better we'll be. And so while this topic is a very hot button issue, it has a very easy answer. Biological sex determines bathrooms and sports teams. It's also a good reminder tonight that doesn't mean we can disrespect or we can mistreat families of different worldviews. Um, they belong in the district. They're our neighbors. We love them. Uh, but when it comes to this specific question about this part of the school, we do need to draw a line. Uh, my flat answer to this is no. Um, we don't need to, to be worried about the gender identity in the schools. Uh, to me, it's not a school issue. It's just a family issue, a personal issue. Uh, so that's something that should be dealt with on the outside of the school. Uh, these young ladies and women have worked too long and too hard you know, to get to where they are, to get their own uh, sports, their own, uh, um, oh, what's the word, they want to go to college. Uh, Thank you. Scholarships. Uh, you know, they worked too hard and too long to get the scholarships, and we had um, Article 9 come in for all that. So they deserve it, they need it, and I think they should keep it that way. Excuse me if I rambled. <laughs> Thank you. Mine short, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would only support bathrooms and locker rooms based on student biological gender. I think you're forgetting me again. I'll keep it pretty easy. Um, I support the policies that will keep our children safe and secure and protected and included for who they are. Um, I think that every district needs to decide on their own, on their own population. I know that. I, I've been on the board for three years, and we've never talked about this as a board. I think that it is a big issue in the media. I think it invokes a lot of fear and a lot of questions. Only it's my opinion, all of our children need to be protected and safe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Tanya, I'll start with you on this one. Um, teacher retention and sustainable salaries for teachers and staff seem to be a potential breaking point for our school district. As a candidate, what do you believe is the best approach for attracting, paying, and retaining quality teachers? And will that require a tax increase for the people? Um, amazing question. I think. I I also kind of already answered this earlier. A big, people of course, you know, they choose a job over money and over the benefits and everything, okay, but they also choose a job by the climate and the culture, how their bosses treat them. Um, teachers also choose a job based upon about the living conditions in the community. And the community, just, um, they've not made it a practice in order to teach our educators well. And so um, I think that the conditions for the teachers have to improve. And that also includes the compensation, if that includes a tax hike or elimination of the Prop C waiver or both. I mean, I think it's whatever it takes in order to be able to pay our educators a living wage. Thank you. A 
okay, uh, the best way is by compensation. I know we took a path down there for the four-day week, but uh, we, we could compare ourselves with independents demographically as far as our population of poverty rate and things like that. But you realize there, there's about 500 districts in the state and 117 of them have gone to four day and been on for several years. And other than Warrington, Missouri, at 3,000 population, that's the biggest you jump core to independents. When they went out and did the four day, they had 25 school districts within a 25 minute drive of the independent school district to draw off of. We don't have that, so if we'd have went four day, it would have caused a lot of chaos. Besides, we would not have been able to get quality teachers. We might have get a lot of new teachers. So um, compensation is the way to go. Guess what? We can only do that by a levy. We aren't even talking about a levy. We haven't talked about a levy for a long time. I think our public and our, our, I think our taxpayers, who I'm looking out for, would support a levy right now if it went strictly to teachers and staff, not administrators. That seems to be the million dollar question right now, not just here in St. Joe, but across the country. So if I had the right answer, I'd bottle it and sell it and then really truly retire from education. But um, I think listening to our teachers, you know, asking me as a board member what I think is a great thing, but sitting down and really asking our teachers, what is it that's going to get you to stay here in St. Joseph, Missouri? What is it that's going to get you to retain? Uh, or as to retain you here is the most important thing that we could do. Uh, the retention part to me is more important than the recruiting part, even though we do have a lot of positions to fill, but we need to keep those veteran teachers here. I do believe compensation, that's the first thing that comes up. And if it requires a levy to go to our community and ask for teacher raises, I would support that. But I think there are some other things that we can do. Um, for our teachers, but the most important thing we can do is support them, show them that they have a community that supports them. I don't think they believe that right now. And then uh, support them as a board, truly be listeners and let them know that we are, you know, their cheerleaders and we support them. Yeah, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, being attractive enough in all aspects of a, of a district to uh, retain and hire. And uh, so I would support a uh, tax increase to get that done. Again, not only for the pay, but for the fact that that will allow us to fill all the dozens of open jobs that help make teachers' lives better day to day, uh, being fully staffed in the district. The other thing I would mention uh, that doesn't get a lot of play, in fact, it gets a lot of negative play, but um, you know, a lot of job satisfaction depends on your supervisor. You're the leader in each building. And I think there has been a little bit of ignoring of, of skill development and leadership development in the district. I'm happy to report I've been a part of uh, bringing some of that to the district. And uh, it's really energized the leadership team. I think they're looking at how they get the same quality leadership in every single building so those teachers know uh, they've got somebody that uh, supports them and has their back. Thank you. Being the spouse of a first grade teacher, I hope I get this question right or I'll be in trouble, but most teachers will tell you the big three C's, compensation, student conduct, and classroom size. I spoke a lot about that tonight, uh, so let's keep going. In our rec recruitment and retention meetings, which I've attended the last six months, the teachers have come back with some ideas, such as hiring more full-time subs, buyback programs for vacation and sick days once they hit a benchmark. Uh, those programs can be explored. But the, when it comes to a levy, I think before we worry about raising more money, we also need to evaluate our budget and ask the question, does our budget reflect a prioritization of teachers and staff? If we're going to spend six weeks, eight weeks saying that the greatest asset we have is building staff, then why don't we go to the finance guy and ask him, does our budget reflect that also? Because a lot of times your priorities can be established with where you spend your money. And so before we go to the public, I'd like to see our budget honor and prioritize the building staff before other unnecessary things. And then also a long-term plan would help our retention quite a bit. My wife for the last six years has had to worry, is my school closing? Is my school not closing? Is this school closing? Is this being reboundaried? You know what? Employees don't like an unpredictable employer. We need dependability, not just for our families and our students. We need dependability for our employees so they know where they're going to work next year and the year after and the year after. Long-term plan, reevaluate the budget, and keep listening to teachers. Sorry, yeah. I'm a preacher, I get wound up, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
As far as, uh, it's, it's just the bitter pill like everybody else has already said. There is going to have to be a tax issue involved in this eventually. That's all there is to it. Uh, you know, you think about how much you'd like to be paid for your job. Well, teachers feel the same way. But, you know, but the teachers got to deal with issues every day of psychological issues of uh, children, and then they also got to worry about teaching these children at the same time. Um, I, I think another big thing is like what Jacob said is that, you know, we, had to, we need to have their back. We need to have the teachers back. They have to know they're being supported 100% of the way. You know, if a group of teachers gets together and comes up with a plan to deal with the issues. The principal approves it. First time the issue comes up, principal throws them all under the bus. Would you want to work with somebody like that? I know I wouldn't. Uh, and also the same thing. Uh, you'd like to know from day to day if you're going to have a job or not. Being somebody who's in the blue collar sector, I've worked for the airline industry for the past 40 years of my life, and there's nothing worse than walking into work every day thinking, is this my last day? Is this the day I get my pink slip? It, it, it's not fun. That's where I get all these gray hairs. <laughs> I'm against the levy. I think we can take it out of the budget. We all live within our means, right? Why shouldn't the school district start tightening it up? They, they have a lot of outside spending on things that are not necessary. Also, the administration and the teachers are not tied together. We should not ever do a solid thing across the board. They say that administration will never get a raise. Well, they can get a raise. So let's say the teacher gets 5%, administration gets 1%, would even it out more. But also, every other time we do a raise, we can skip administration. I mean, some of them are making $200,000 compared to someone making 38000 You can't do a straight across 4%. It makes no sense. You can also incentivize teachers when everybody in their classroom passes, give them a hefty bonus. That's what we want. We want education. Let's pay them good teachers who are really getting to these kids. Let's pay them well. Give them a bonus. And we can do it out of the budget. These levies, okay, so we got a $20 million bond, which I'm against it. I'm probably the only one up here. They made it up. It, we need this stuff because actually we want an $80 million bond capacity so we can start building new. I say until we get our students educated, we don't build nothing new. We, we start where we should start. All of our money should go towards educating our kids. If this bond does not pass, okay, it's going to come up again in August. So are we going to have this bond, a levy for new schools, a levy for teachers? That'll never pass. We're not going to pass three of them. We'll be lucky to pass one. Let, let's wait and slow down and do what we need to do. Let's take care of things first. So okay. I'm against this, a, this bond. And I'm against the levy. I think we can do it in our budget. I think we can Thank Thank tighten you. up. Thank you. As a former teacher from St. Joe, I know what it feels like uh, to get the salaries that teachers in our community get. Uh, one of the things that I would like to see, as, as, as well as increases for our teachers, but also uh, continuing some of the programs that we have that are um, a means to attract our current students in St. Joe to stay in St. Joe as a teacher through our Grow Your Own program. Kansas City is, is already doing that. They're already paying student teachers to come and student teach in their district. And so I think looking at how are we going to keep the college students that we have right here in our community, because I know we have good students here. I would want them to teach my grandchildren. So I think also looking at how are we going to retain the teachers that are currently learning how to be teachers right here in our own community is a good um, situation to be thinking about as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, due to our time, we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, and then, actually, the closing comments. There are so many issues that we could address and, and, and haven't at, up to this point, but uh, certainly we would like to, you guys just to sum up your candidacy and why you believe you're the best person to be on the school board and uh, share your closing thoughts and, and heart with those here tonight. We'll start with LaTanya, and you can give your closing statement. 
Good evening, everyone. As I stated earlier, I'm Latanya Williams, and I am the current president of our school board. And I would like to thank Pastor Blevins and your organization for allowing me to come here and speak. And I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit nervous, and so I do appreciate you giving a very cordial forum. Thank you so much. Um, and my why, in all honesty, I have a why right up in the audience in the front. I work with kids every single day. A couple of, of the individuals up here um, called me a workhorse. And of course, it was a compliment. It was a compliment. And um, everything I do is to improve these kids and their educational opportunities. Um, in my time on the board, it's been a lot of change. It's been a lot of, it's been a lot of um, differences, I should say, um, but Our board needs to be a board where everyone on the community is represented, everyone in the community has a voice, even if it is a voice that you do not agree with on your own. Other people need to be able to look at a board and be able to know that there is a person up there that understands about their lives, about their kids, about their lifestyles, about their needs, and is willing to advocate and to protect and to educate their children, and I am that person for them. Thank you. You all pay the bills. That's who I'm here first for and why I'm running again. You pay the bills. Members, taxpayers first then everything else comes along just fine. If you trust us, if I'm spending your money correctly, then the rest of this comes easy. Early childhood development is the best bang for a buck. Teacher compensation is important, along with a lot of other things as well. And I agree we can do it out of our present budget of $146 million, a lot more than we're doing. Um, it's as simple as this. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's as simple as that. And finally, I want to thank the rest of the candidates for stepping up and running. Thank you very much for stepping up and running. We have a good bunch up here that are concerned about our school district. I also want to thank you all as the audience for being here. We need more of this all the time. We need you. And then finally, thank you very much, Grace Church. An outstanding job again. Thank you very much. And um, great job. Thank you. The Lord gave me this scripture as I contemplated running again for the school board. It's found in Galatians 6, 9, and it says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I'm not willing to give up on the St. Joseph School District. I'm ready to get back to work. Um, I have 34 years in education, 19 years as an elementary school teacher, 7 years as a middle school teacher, and in my, in my fifth year as... Um, after retirement as a high school teacher. I'm passionate about kids. I'm passionate about public education. As I said earlier, I was fortunate enough in my career to work with DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and have a background in curriculum and assessment that I think will be a benefit as a board member. I, um, I was blessed to, be, to serve as president of the Missouri State Teachers Association, which is an association, not a union, in our state with 44,000 members. And I worked alongside uh, DESE to establish policy and alongside our legislature to establish 
establish legislation that would benefit our public schools here in Missouri. This is my 34th year to work with local legislators, or 31st year, I'm sorry, to work with local legislators and state legislators on um, legislation that benefits our schools. And so I take um, this work very seriously and I am uh, very, very, I'm excited about bringing all of this experience and this skill set back to the St. Joseph Board of Education. Again, I served six years on the board, three years in leadership, and I feel like that skill set will be beneficial to this current board as we work to bring some order into quorum and to get them back on and get us as a group, uh, if I'm privileged to be reelected back on course and uh, bring that um, St. Joseph School District back to the center of our community. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity tonight to be here and I wanna thank uh, Grace Cal Calvary Chapel for this forum tonight, thank you. Folks, uh, thanks for your kind attention tonight and, and thanks to Vote, Vote St. Joe for putting this together, running it so well, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, you know, my name is Mike Moore. Um, I'm a 30-year, I'm an engineer by training, I'm a 30-year business guy. Uh, I, I, I like to think I've done okay in, in, in building teams and managing a business, uh, working on workforce development. Uh, my wife Kim and I have lived in St. Joseph for 20 years. We grew up in Atchison, so never been far. Um, uh, we sent our kids through the district. We have twins. They graduated back in 2017, and I've managed to stay involved with the district uh, through a lot, of, a number of, of efforts, and 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 also with the community, uh, through United Way and other agencies, um, and so I offer tonight. I, I, I you know, we get asked a lot what our vision is for the district. I've kind of, I kind of turned that into a hey, how do we know we're successful? How would we know we're successful as the district? And what I've said to that is three simple but very difficult to achieve things. And the first one is we need more students achieving their potential. We need teachers and staff talking about how the district is just a great place to work. And we need the community, including the businesses, to recognize St. Joe School District as a positive asset to retain the families we have and to recruit new ones to town. Thanks for your kind attention. My why is that I'm invested in the school district. Uh, my wife has served for 14 years in the school district. I understand the immense value that teachers have, how they change lives every day, and I want to make sure that we're equipping and encouraging all building staff to do that great work. I'm invested with my children. We have four kids that attend the district. I understand the impact this district has on our kids. I understand how much time they're in the buildings, and I want to make sure that they have the best educational experience, not just my kids, but every kid. And as a school volunteer, you know, we run two good news clubs at Pickett and Elementary, and, and, and Pickett Elementary and Hosey Elementary. I've also served on PTA. When you get to meet the kids of this community, you, you see very quickly they deserve a good education. And I want to make sure that we, we provide that from the board down. But really, why I'm running is that my wife and I are the product of school districts. My, my dad passed away 20 years to today. Uh, my wife grew up with a mother that was homeless and some uh, substance abuse in her house. We got through our childhood because our local schools invested in us and prepared us for a successful future. And I want to make sure every kid in our community has that same chance. So I'm a product of a school district that put kids first and did everything they could to prepare them, and I want to continue that tradition. If you're wondering why you should vote for me, because I'm a critical thinker with a servant's heart, and I think we need that on the board. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thank the Grace Church for having us. Is this webcasted tonight? Yes. Thank you, because uh, as I said earlier, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been in the aviation business for the past 40 years. For the past uh, 12 years ago, 12 years, I had to commute between here and Dallas. And I watched the last time there was a forum on the uh, uh, school board, and I watched it from here. So thank you all for doing that tonight. I really appreciate it. But um, I never did say this earlier, but my name is Warren Ingram. Uh, I'm a graduate of Benton High School uh, in 1979. I'm a military retiree. I was in the Marine Corps, and I retired from the Kansas Air National Guard. Uh, my wife and I built a nice, beautiful house down in the south end on the original Benton High School football field. Love my house, love my school. Um, got two great kids. Both of them are involved with uh, the uh, uh, media arts. One works for the Associated Press. The other one works for the local NPG outlet. Um, also, um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my place here. 
But uh, somebody originally said, why do I want to run? Well, it was, goes back to that little girl earlier I told you about that was in the class saying that she, she just so upset that she had to put up with the steals in class. Before that, I, I was so worried about the blue collar essence we're losing the training in schools. You know, uh, some years ago, there was a, a admin person that said that the wave of the future is just computers. Okay, who's gonna fix those computers? I mean, they really seem to think that computers are gonna drive the garbage truck around. Who's gonna fix the garbage truck? So I really think that's one of the first reasons why I wanted to get involved with this, is that I wanna see the blue collar, more blue collar uh, training in schools. If we can, bring shop classes back to full force like they used to be, drafting, hands-on drafting, things of that nature. And then, uh, like I said, when, but when I saw that little girl, I want to get them a good education. I want them to care. I want them to show up and know that they are worried about, they are taken care of, and they will have a safe place at that school. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep it short. I just want a better community. I want all students to have a fighting chance. I, I want to start focusing our money on education and put the shiny buildings and everywhere we dump money. I, I want to stop that. I want to stop asking taxpayers to give and give and give. I want to tighten our belts. I, I want to go through line by line. There's things I don't see. I do look, but we also don't itemize things anymore. Here about five years ago when I first started looking, let's just say toilet paper, it was by school. You knew how much went everywhere. Now it's combined to the whole town. So how much goes where? I mean, I, I think it needs to be itemized more. I, I think we need to tighten up on money and spend it where it should be spent on education. I want to thank you all for coming in, coming out tonight and really being concerned about the children in our community. I think uh, the biggest strength I can bring to the district is the fact that I have been connected with the St. Joe's School District in some way or another my entire career. Um, I have a passion for children. I worked in title buildings in St. Joe. I saw children who came to school without underwear, without socks, without coats without hats, and I worked with a wonderful group of teachers at Edison where we embraced those children and took care of their physical needs first because until those are met, we really honestly can't educate the children in our community. So my goal of being on the board is to bring a positive light to our school district, to everyone. I advocate for the St. Joe School District with my Missouri Western students. I advocate for the St. Joseph School District with the faculty in my department, of which none of them live in St. Joe. But I tell them how wonderful um, the teachers are, how wonderful, all well, the wonderful things that we have going on. Um, I work with teachers um, across the state through some early childhood trainings that I do. So right now I'm working with North Kansas City Schools. I work with uh, Kansas City Public Schools. I work with St. Louis Schools. And so I am in other districts, and I see things that they have to offer. And our district, honestly, lots of times, the things that they think are brand new, our district has already thought of and is already doing. And I want to enlighten our community on the great things that we have in our community and that we should be proud of the school district that we have and look at the positive things that we have going on rather than the focus, which I feel like sometimes we focus on all the bad things. But really, look at those teachers that come to work every day and work hard with those children that have no one in their life they can trust but the teacher that stands in front of them. So I also want us to think about our own favorite teacher that we had going to school. And that teacher made a difference in our life no matter what it was. But also to think about that without a teacher in our life, none of us would have the jobs that we have. So being a teacher is a very important career. And I want everyone to understand that. And that's what I try to instill in the students that I have at Missouri Western of how important our career is. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now let's give all our candidates a round of applause. Uh, thank you all for coming. We appreciated hearing your hearts and your thoughts. Um, before we close, this is a church and I'm a pastor. The Bible we preach here commands us all to pray for those in authority. And so I will close out the evening with a short prayer. Father God in heaven, we come to you, and we thank you for those leaders in our community. Your word uh, says that you have given them the authority they have. It comes from you. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray for our city council. 
for our current school board members, and for all those running, for our school staff and our teachers. Lord, we pray that you would give them all great wisdom. Uh, your word says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we pray, Lord, that you would fill their minds with creative solutions and ideas that will bring about the best results for the community that you've called us to steward and to live in. We ask for your favor to be upon them and that you place those uh, in authority that you see fit best for this time in this place. But be with all of them, Lord. Be with each of their hearts and each of their minds and each of their families. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming again.